and welcome to another episode of the tantalizing comedies paradise now today's guest is an absolute wonder he is Dwayne the Rock Johnson reincarnated from Brixton he's he, he has a very colorful life he's gone from being in the car boots of a car, of a, some very dodgy men to being in prison for seven years to now helping change people's lives he is the remarkable Junior Atkins. Yeah, that was, a, that was an intro, wasn't it? <laughs> was it better than the last one? Uh, yeah, but a bit on par, yeah. The, the, Dwayne, the, the Dwayne Rock Johnson reincarnated from Brixton. <laughs> but yeah, I'll take that. Oh, really? why not? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and how's the cat doing? Is the cat all right? Cats, yeah, cats having a kip here. I've got one on there on the footstool there as well. They're chilled Good. out, they've eaten, they're relaxed. They're just like, I've eaten, the cats have eaten, they're chilled. Good. Now, for anyone that doesn't know about you, tell us a bit about your life story in a short summary of how you became a man that helps re rehabilitate people and help people better their lives. Okay, so uh, well, I grew up in South London, uh, Stockwell Park Estate, which is dead in the middle of Brixton and stuff. Well, uh, grew up there with my brother, my mum, and my dad. Uh, my mum and dad were only young by the time they had me and my brother, they were like 18 by the time they had us. Um, my dad was a bit of a career criminal. Uh, my mum was a hard working woman, you know, with, with put, putting food on the table for me and my brother. And, and yeah, I mean, we've been. In, the, in Brixton that time in the early 80s, it was quite renowned. Uh, it was quite a rough place to live in those times. So I um, sort of got caught up maybe, you know, with, with the, in the community, running around with a load of friends of mine at that age, growing up, getting up to all sorts of skullduggery, the usual type of, uh, you know, pathway for certain people that were around at that time in, in this area. So, um, yeah, I started off petty crimes, fighting, gang stuff, you know, going on to other things, burglaries, robberies, drug dealing, drug taking, drug dealing, in that order, or whichever order, it's together, um, and sort of going up from there. So, yeah, so we went from being young kids just running around the estate to sort of um, probably being, I don't know, what's the word, word for it, really, just sort of, just completely off the rails, basically. In terms of every, in, in in every sense of the word. Okay, and what about what? Didn't you you like your father was uh, was uh, was was involved in crime beforehand, right? Yeah, yeah. There goes the cat. I don't know now. Bored already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So my, my dad was already like I said, he was already like a criminal, career criminal, involved. You know, he. You know, um, he fell around with the sort of the older, the older statesmen and gangsters of of South London. So it was no, it was all pretty normalised for me. You know, coming down in the front room, sitting in the front room with my dad, all these mates all smoking cigarettes and plotting plotting moves here and there. So um, yeah. So was any of it like lock, stock, and two smoking barrels? No, I should have <laughs> said that. <laughs> um. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe for maybe for someone like yourself, looking from the outside looking in, it might have looked like that. Yeah, it was pretty serious <laughs> being in the middle of it. So uh, yeah, big lot stuck in uh, two small barrels. More for the more for the big screen and more for the the little screen. Ah, fair enough. But no, but what's the what's the misconception that people have in that environment? Growing up in that environment, that you think people. Often have. I mean, so what, what do you mean, misconception of what, what do you mean, sort of like? Well, well I, what, I suppose a misconception could be that, you know, it can sound pretty rough and it can sound terrible to some people, it can sound traumatic. That I saw things that happen, I saw a lot of violence, I saw, you know, um, you know, things that young people probably my age wouldn't normally, normally see. Um, but when you're actually living in it, you know, I mean, my mum and dad. You know, I mean, especially my mum. I mean, she was, uh, she was the, the the main provider here, and she done everything she can for me and my brother. We had a nice home, 
you know, uh, my dad might have been out doing what he was doing, drinking, robbing banks, whatever he was doing at that time. But, um, in terms of inside the house, we had a nice home. You know, a loving home, a caring home. Hmm. We didn't want for anything. And what, yeah, okay. And, and what, um, but what was the, what's, what was the area like? Was there, was there, I mean, a lot of people often assume that when you, there was also a lot of love in the area, even though there was a lot of bad things going on. It was a, it was a community. I mean, it, it, was a, it was a rough community if you wasn't from around here, but if you grew up here, it's what you know, isn't it? The minute I walked out the door and I made friends, I mean, I'm still, I'm still very lucky to say that 40 years later, uh, I'm still friends with the, with the guys I made friendships with when I was seven. They're all still, you know, the ones that are still about, um, you know, it's not in prison or, you know, or dead. They're still, it's, it's still mates today. So, uh, so it could be, even though it was a rough era, there was a camaraderie there. And we, we've been together for this whole time. Even though our lives have gone in different places, even to this day, I still talk to people. I've still got friends that are, pretty active out there, you know, they're doing their thing, that's fair enough, that's up to them. I don't judge them. Um, you know, and they, they see me, they know what I'm doing now, I'm not involved in anything, I'm literally just, you know, working and studying and trying to be a better person for myself and my kids. Hmm. Do, do you bump into them every now and then? Yeah, 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 no, we meet up, we, we, we still meet up every now and then, and we, you know, we got a WhatsApp group, we talk and, you know, I'm still in the area, I still live around here. You know, I've lived there. I've lived there since nineteen seventy, just since I was born, nineteen seventy six. So um, you know, I've never gone anywhere other than prison. But other than that, I've always come back. Okay. And how? With so you you had a sort of colourful life growing up, but how how did it how did it get to the stage where you got into? Prison and then how? What was prison like? And what's the misconception of being in prison? Uh, it's prison. First went to prison on remand uh, when I was sixteen. Uh, done a week in Felton. Came out from that. Um, when I turned seventeen. I got done for robbery and I got three years. Uh, when I was seventeen, they gave me three years. I remember at that time. This was in nineteen ninety three. Three years was a big sentence for kids my age. Then nowadays, these kids are going to prison for thirty years and twenty years. But in those days, my friends that went to prison, they went away for like six weeks or eight weeks, eighteen months tops. The three years was a really big sentence. Um, and I've done over over a year and a half out of that. Came out when I was nineteen. Uh, then at twenty one, I got arrested again. I got eight years when I was twenty one for uh, knowing concern in importation of cocaine from Cuba. Oh, and how did, <laughs> how did you manage to do that? How did you manage to do the, the smuggle? The, how did you get the contacts and like do all of that? Well, it was, that was, yeah. I mean, that was all done, but I, I was over in Cuba, spent a little time over there. Um, there was a few of us, there was four of us involved in it. I was, like I said, I was 21. More balls than brains. I mean, you know, and I just really didn't give a shit. I, I had no fear of anything. So I think an opportunity came up. Um, and I said, I'll do that. Why not? Why not just walk, go from Cuba to Gatwick with three and a half kilos of cocaine? It seemed like a normal thing to do. So, all right, good money. Um, yeah, so. Obviously, got called, came back, came back, got to Gatwick. And the, the funny thing is, it was the first time I'd ever been on a plane as well. I'd never even traveled before. First time on the plane, I went to Cuba and smuggled three and a half kilos of cocaine. So coming back through uh, Gatwick, you know, I'm like a fish out of water anyway, because I don't even understand what's what. I don't know where you go, I don't know where you walk, I don't know about the Green Channel, I don't know all this stuff that I don't know. I was 21. I was fucking coked out my head. Literally on so much cocaine in Cuba. I've done so much. I mean, I've, I came back whiter than I went out there. And it was like 30 odd degrees where it was. And I mean, I'm really hot. And I was in a hotel room sniffing coke the whole time and planning, planning moves. So, um, so yes, yeah, so no wonder I got pulled up by the customs officer anyway. That's. <laughs> yeah. And 
What, what, so when you got into prison or all that, what, what, what were you expecting when you went into prison, before you went into prison, but what were the surprises of being in prison? Uh, the, there wasn't actually any surprise. I mean, to, it, it, this could sound to people that don't understand. I mean, when I was growing up, I always knew that I was going to prison. It was just going to be, uh, you know, another... Uh, uh, I mean, let me just care. One second, one second. Yeah, it was uh, just an occupational hazard. Uh, that's how it was seen. So I always sort of knew. Um, I, I grew up visiting my dad in prisons. Um, you know, friends have been in prison, so I knew what what was what it was going to be like. But I didn't at that age, especially before I went to Felton. It was almost like written that no, I'm going to go to prison one day. And that's it. So when it finally happened, I was totally fine with it. I suppose when I got done, after I'd done the free and came out and got arrested for the importation, um, then I knew that I was in the, the big boys league then. It was gonna be, I was going to get a big sentence and it was going to be a long time before I got out. So um, again, it was, I think the insanity of it, where my head was at, I just accepted it, you know? I just accepted it. There's no sort of uh, crying about it or no, it was just part and parcel. It's just okay. Not next year, not the year after, not the year after, not the year after, but the year after I'll get parole. And that just seemed normal. No, oh, okay. And when when you got into prison, do you do you get this stupid question a lot? This is the thing that a lot of people say. And I think you're gonna know what I'm gonna Probably. say. <laughs> what is the soap question? No, I'm joking. I'm not going to ask that. I've seen the Naked Gun. How much of that is true? Naked Gun. Well, there's a scene in the Naked Gun where oh. the the guy drops the soap, and then yeah. then so, then they all true. jump out the shower and run no, away. That, that might be in America, but you don't see. You know, I've I've spent. Uh, you know, I grew up in prison. You know, so from the age of seventeen to twenty six, I was in prison. And I never see one bum rape or anything like that. It's all bullshit. I think, you know, I, I, you know, I'm pretty sure it does happen in American jails. I'm pretty sure there's consensual sex going on in prison. Uh, but just men getting raped in showers, that don't happen over here. You know, I, yeah. That's it's, just, it's, just a, it's just a nice little uh, myth and story that people like to say, oh, you got raped in showers, but it, it don't happen. Uh, and when you... You told me this, like, in the last interview that, you know, prison, I, I watched another podcast, I think, with a, he's, he's a, I think, Sneaker, or, no, not Sneaker, some other guy, he, Ghost, he was called, he was a former colonel, but he says that there's a lot of bullying that goes on in prisons, and he said that some of them would actually try and push people to commit suicide in prison, but what actually goes on in between prisons with the cellmates what's it what's actually goes on what really goes on see i would i would sort of disagree with that because in felton like the young offenses there was a lot of bullying i mean the bullying was off the scale you know kids were getting bullied left right and sent up so like you know getting a canteen taken off them um they'd be sitting in their cells and their people are making them sing nursery rhymes out their window proper humiliate bully you know um uh, and that would go on a lot in the adult prisons. You know, bullies are look, look bullies are looked down on. You know what I mean, if someone's a bully, they get it. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of fights going on, but the fights that are going on, if you're an okay person and you're not causing any drama and you're not a grass and you're not a nonce and you're not, you know, you can get through prison okay. okay. You know? Even the smallest fella, you know what I mean? Doesn't matter, you know, like because people don't like bullies. Like in, in, Generally, in British prisons, in English prisons, you know, a bully's shunned upon. You know, if somebody's known as a bully, they would get it by the by the proper boys, because proper boys in prison ain't bullies. No, oh. you know, the proper the proper top boys, they're not bullies. You know, they don't take no shit, but they definitely they definitely don't like bullies. Have you had any incident of that where you've seen someone that's a bully get get ironed out? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, a lot. Or somebody comes in and they've got a bit of attitude and they, they you know, they try to sort of, uh, you know, try to throw their weight about on the first day. But, they, you know, you can see that they're just being, they're just trying to intimidate people. Someone will come and give them, come, someone will come and chin them or something, or just take them in a cell, give them a wide in, put them in their place. And then that's it. 
the thing is, if you don't go in there humble, you know, unless unless you're somebody that wants, you know, you've got grievance in there and you want to go and have a run, that's how you want to do your sentence. You can do your sentence, but you do it down the block most of it. To go in prison, if you want to be okay in prison and you're a humble person, you know, and you're not a wrong one, you, you'll be fine. Mm. Is, well, what is, is there any, um, what's the thing I wanted to ask? Is there any, in American prisons, they've got a big race war. Like there's, mm -hmm. there's you've got the Latinos, the, Sp the blacks and the whites. And I heard that in the British prisons that there's a big, a lot of prisoners are converting to Islam or something. And that th there's a big brotherhood with the Islam prisoners. Is any of that true? Okay, so that, 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 when I was in prison, I went away. So I was away in the nineties, and I came back in two thousand and two. Uh, and I, I have to say, you know, and I don't mean this in any sort, of, but before um, before nine eleven, there wasn't much. Of, there was no sort of divide there or anything like that. After nine eleven, there seemed to be more of a divide between uh, Islamic, you know, and, and non-Islamic. Um, oh. No, yeah. I was saying, I was saying, oh, oh okay, yeah. So, I wasn't, I wasn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, so what I've heard nowadays, nowadays it is a big separation. You're either part of the brotherhood or you're not. I, I don't know. I can't, I can't actually um, report on that because this is all sort of in the last 15, 20 years. The last 15 years that's happened. Oh, so I don't know. Is, does it make them, make the prisoners much worse than, than they were before with this sort of separation, do you think? Again, I'm, I've not been, this is before, this is after I came out, so uh, I wouldn't know. Okay. And we mentioned this before in the episode that didn't get put up, but you mentioned that there's a lot of skullduggery by not only the, the prisoners, but the actual prison guards. Can you tell us a bit more about that? I know you mentioned that they yeah, would say- what, you, you, what the question was, was he was asking about how they get stuff in. Yeah, and you know, and a lot of the times, obviously, parcels. So people, people go and visit, and they will stick stuff up their ass to get it in the prison. Now, there's no uh, secret behind that. But nowadays, the parcels are getting bigger, you know, because now you can't have you can't have tobacco. Um, so people pouches of tobacco, and and prison officers are bringing it in. They're getting paid a lot of money, a lot, a lot of money, just to bring in a, a two ounce pouch of tobacco. No, an ounce of tobacco or two ounces of tobacco is selling for five hundred pound nowadays in prison. You know, so what's a twenty-five pound pouch out here or whatever it costs nowadays? They're charging like five or six hundred pound. Hmm. So a lot of prison officers, and you got to remember as well, there's a lot of people in prison have got money. There's a lot of real, you know, some proper like earners have got money plugged away, and you've got these prison officers that are earning probably. 30 grand a year, you know what I mean? Tops, they've got a mortgage, they've got a wife and kids. So if someone's going to come and um, offer them, I don't know, a thousand pounds just to bring something, they're going to do it. And they're doing mobile phones as well. And they're bringing phones. You know, you've got the little tiny phones, you've got these little tiny phones that, that prisoners can have, but now everybody wants, they want uh, smartphones because they want to use the internet and they want to video call their, their girlfriends or, and whatnot. So, um, yeah, bring them in. And you, you said that they'll be very subtle in the way that they would go about getting the money. Like you said that they'll mention things to prisoners who they thought of money. Say, oh, my daughter yeah. needs some help or something. How would they do it again? What was it? What's... Yeah, that, I mean, it happened to me. It happened to me a few times in the prison. Uh, prison officers sort of be hanging around and be like, just sort of asking questions about, you know, how much the cocaine was worth, you know, just sort of things and start talking about their own you know, uh, their own hardships, dropping little hints, thinking that probably I may have money outside, but I didn't, I was skinned, so they got the wrong person. <laughs> but uh, because of what I was in for, and I was in for importation, you know, there was a lot of them thinking, oh, let's have a chat. So I knew for a fact, if I if I had the money, I, I knew who to go to. Uh, do you know what I mean? So there'd be certain prison officers that had already sort of marked my card that, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit short. So if there's anything going, I'll do it. And um, yeah, so yeah, very subtle, but you knew what they were doing. They were just trying to sort of like, uh, you know, sort of do a little recce and find out who's got what. Hmm. That's true. Oh, okay, that that's was. Did it surprise you in terms of like what you saw there? I mean, did you actually see any situation where someone that you actually saw a rich prisoner actually 
sort of deal out with a prison officer. Yeah, I mean, you would. I mean, we'll actually have it right in front of you, but we know this company we knew stuff was coming in. We knew when the stuff it was coming in, that was it. That's all we need to know. So they'd be like, right, we've got a load of stuff coming in. What do you want? And we put our orders in, and yeah. And and how was it for them for the prison officers when they got caught doing dodgy things? And he became prisoner of themselves. I yeah. can imagine they didn't have a good time when they got, got in. But, I mean, it's in the papers every other week nowadays. You see some prison officers been caught uh, taking a phone into a prison and they've got a couple of years or... So, I mean, I never met a prison officer in prison, but like, it, it was happening, do you know what I mean? So they would be, they'd be put on the um, they'd be put on the numbers, do you know what I mean? On the uh, Sigurd, uh, Rule 43, uh, with the, with the uh, Nazis and the grasses. That'd be put protection wing. That's what it is, protection wing. Yeah. It's I, I can't imagine what it's like for them. I mean the, the people in the dodgy areas, like they got society not liking them, and then the prisoners wanting to rip their heads off. I mean, you really are alone if you're one of those prisoners, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. What what was the worst situation you encountered that? Because I saw in the newspaper that one of the guys that did that, there was a guy bragging in the newspaper about how he went in and beat the shit out of them. Yeah. Uh, out of what? What was that? Sorry. I think it was with the where those two girls got killed by a guy, and he uh, there was a guy that bragged about beating the shit out of him. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. But the thing is, as well, especially with those those high profile fucking monsters, you know what I mean? Like you and Andy and your Levi. Yeah. What's his face? Bed, Bedfield. Bedfield. Those people there. People want to go and do them something. Do you know what I mean? Because not only are you getting a nonce and a child killer or something like that, you know, you also get they're also getting a little bit of fame around it as well for being the one who got that guy. Everyone wants, you know, you're a marked man, you know, that's for sure. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's true. That's uh, yeah. Did you feel do you feel sorry for them? No, I don't feel sorry for them. <laughs> no, so no way. No way. No way. Let them rot in hell with the worst possible scenario you know yeah but, but no matter what can happen to, the, to them in there it still won't be uh, good enough you know i mean because there's some really proper monsters in there you you mentioned in uh in the last interview you did that, that you've seen some absolute atrocities by yeah. and you said that there's a lot of hitmen that only do it for like two pounds of drugs or whatever and yeah well 10, ten pound they call it 10 pound jury but a ten pound jury in prison is not like a ten pound, and a jury is like a bag of herring, basically. But a ten pound jury in prison is probably the equivalent to two pounds worth out here. But yeah, so somebody get paid a couple of those to just go and bash someone up because they owe them money or they've done a wrong or they've done something. And um, as I said, I mean, I've seen some real bad things, but I think like the not think the worst one is seeing the oil, uh, boiling oil getting thrown over a man's face. Um, and just literally the guy's skin's melted off his face. I've seen boiling water and sugar loads of times. That's nothing. I mean, that, that burns. But the boiling up uh, oil from the stove, because in certain prisons, especially in long-term prisons, you've got, you've got kitchens and you can cook your own food. You know, it's a bit an extra bit of a privilege, but you, know, you do it on seven so you can buy your own food. You still get the prison food, but you can... You know, um, getting what we call food boats, where a few of us should put your money together when you do a bit of cooking each day. Um, it's a lot that the long term prisoners have got that, that uh, facilities. And um, on this one occasion, this guy put the oil was on, whatever he was doing, whatever he was cooking, I don't know, but the oil was on. The guy has come in, just grabbed the pot and just thrown it in his face while it was out like, boiling. It was like, I could, I could still hear the scream from this day. I wasn't in the kitchen, I was on the wing. So I didn't actually see that happen at the time. It was just a case of the screams and up and then him getting taken out. I saw him when he came back months later. Um, he's a black guy, but his face had all been peeled off. It was all sort of like, uh, pink and uh, it was just horrendous, you know, down here. And did... uh, prison officer, I see a prison officer get stabbed. Uh, oh. Yes, a few stabs. You see a prison officer get stabbed in his chest. Only with a little silly knife. It wasn't because when they got a white shirt on, it's covered in blood. There's literally just a, a homemade little shank. Um, I've seen that. Plenty of prison officers get knocked out. It's quite regular. It's oh, really? Anyway. Oh, okay. 
Is what, what about Charles Bronson? Have you seen him fight? No, that's a stupid question. I'm not going to ask. No, no, no. I've never, I mean, those are people me. I've never, I've never met. Him. I've never been in, in prison with him. But I know loads of people that have been in prison with him. You know, because he's been obviously he's been in the circuit for about forty years. And I don't know what it is now, but um, there's plenty, plenty of people that have, that have crossed paths with him. I, I never crossed paths with him. Now. Hmm. He is, stories. There's loads of stories out there. He is, yeah, he's he's, he's an interesting fellow. I, I hear, I hear, I saw that little video he did with Tom Hardy, where he mm. said um, he talked about that boys in the flood. Or so, do you remember that? I see that. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Yeah. <laughs> it's strangely enough, I think that's a good quote. It's a bit mad and a bit weird, but it's actually a good quote. Yeah. Got it off. <laughs> you see that boy that drowned in the floods. That wouldn't happen to me. I would <laughs> say, cut it off now. <laughs> but yeah, I thought that was a good quote. But with so, what advice would you have? What, what, what if someone does go to prison? What would you say is a survival guide for them? I, I was told this. So when I when I went into when I first went into high down, it was at ACAP prison. At that time, uh, um, it's not anymore. In '98, and there was some A cats on there, some really, really um, 18 gangsters. I mean, and there was one guy uh, that he said to me, uh, his name was Donald Treadwin. Don Treadwin, uh, he's probably dead now, but he was part of the, the Richardson's, part of the Richardson's firm. Um, and he was an old guy, really old guy. He was, he was actually he was actually making the tea in there. And everyone respected him. Um, and he just said to me, he goes, listen, never say anything about anybody you're not willing to say to their face hmm. because it will come back and bite you. So never say, even if you've got the ump with someone, unless you're willing to say it to that person, don't say it to that person because it will. So only ever say what you're willing to say to someone's face. And that, that bit of advice there can seem like, to you might seem like nothing, but in prison, you, as time went on, and I saw the amount of people that came unstuck because they said something about someone, and it came back to them, and they end up getting a beating because you know the um, um, what are they call it, the, um, you know, the, nothing, you know, everything just gets about in prison. People talk because people people are bored as well. So, so people will say, "Oh, that, he was talking about you," just to see a bit of action. So that would be one thing, definitely. Never say anything about anybody you're not willing to say to their face. That'd be one. And be humble. Um, you know, don't take no shit either. Don't be a doormat. You know, but just be, just be. So that'd be my, my advice. Keep humble. Don't do any any wrongs. Don't talk about anyone. Get on with your own bird. Do your own bird. And that's it. Mm. And with. Uh... But with being what was the what, what was the best moment you've had in prison what was the bit where you were... had some great times <laughs> oh, those are great times you know parties um it's about like i mean we had loads of parties we used to make our own alcohol make our own hooch you know get drunk uh there was a, a short period of time i was in full prison which was an open prison coming towards the end of my sentence um, and a mate of mine went over because it was only a small fence it was an open prison went over the fence and went Tesco's Tesco Express bought a big bottle of vodka bought a whole roast chicken all of Bacardi breezes had only just come out things I'd never seen them before Bacardi all these Bacardi breezes and come back in the cell we're all in the cell we got, we're literally having a party and then screws have come in prison officers have come in Saw, the, saw us all sitting there, see the bottle of vodka like that. Saw the roast chicken, I thought we were just taking the piss. We all got nicked, by the way. Um, yeah, I mean, that was a funny time. I met some really, really funny people. I met some really, really good people. Um, some people that I'm still friends with today, um, that I still keep in touch with. And I met some real fucking monsters. And I met some real nutters. You know, and some real gangsters. So I met all different types of people in there. What distinguishes the different characters if you were to see them on the street? <laughs> no, not uh, on the street, but what, what, how, what, what this, how do you spot them if, in prison, like these ones that you're mentioning? Well, the real, real serious guys are the most humble ones. They're the ones that be sitting there playing backgammon. 
that mean that there'd be a few of them, only a few of them there. Now, there won't be a load of people around, there'd be a few, you no know, older, usually older guys, you know, um, sort of humble. You get the loud nutters, you know, the ones that come in their all mouth and everything, and they're just really because they're the most frightened, but they can have a fight as well. So they're out there getting bent up all the time and going down the block. You get the guys that just sort of shouldn't really be there. <laughs> You know I mean, you get the old guy that sort of something happens, something a bit like your, uh, your uh, what's his name in Short Shank Short Shank Redemption. It's kind of okay, yes, the, the main guy, the white guy, in it. the one that keeps getting bothered for a bit of business by the sisters. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, just somebody that there was a lot of people like him you know, that sort of didn't really fit in, shouldn't be there. You need a load of those. Uh, something might have happened. There might have been a drink driving incident or something. You know, so a lot of people like that. And a lot of people that just want to get on with their sentence. They're just there, no problem, don't want to cause any problem. Um, you know, but can look after themselves still, but don't need to be an aggro. Don't need aggro. Hmm. And with what was what with the with the one thing that you mentioned last week, you said that being in a rough area, being in a life of crime, you learned a lot more about people than you would have had you not been on those. Yeah. What are the th key things that you would say that you learned about people and how to handle people as a result yeah, of your well, upbringing and experiences? I think when you, when you sort of, you know, if you lived the lifestyle I lived and it was, you know, you're, you're out on the road, you're on offer, you know, it's a violent, a violent world. You need to learn to read people pretty quick. And in prison, everything's magnified another thousand times. So anything can piss somebody off and it can go. It can kick off any time. As much as I said it is, you know, it could be cool and there's no bullying, it can kick off, you know, because things get misconstrued in prison. You know, you say the wrong thing. So you have to learn very quickly, you know, the science of who's who, you know, how you can talk, what pant you can have. For some people, you can't have that. And I can have a pant with you now. And it's just a bit of banter, but in prison, that somebody that's got a situation, because there's a lot of mental health in prison as well. <clears throat> you know, you have to be careful because you might say something, bam, it kicks off and it can just go for the time. You know, so you have to learn uh, people's skills in a way which I call emotional intelligence. You know, no matter how much intelligence you've got, it will not get you through prison. You need emotional intelligence, you need EQ to be able to read a situation. You know, so I would know for a fact, if I'm talking to someone, I can read straight away from their body language, from their facial expressions, the way they move, what they're doing, what's going to come next. And I can tell whether this is getting a bit and I need to rein it in or I can, you know, so um, that <clears throat> that there is key because some a lot of people don't have that emotional intelligence where they can um, sort of register somebody where somebody's at just by their facial expressions and where I've got that. You know, and I've had that from a young age. And I think my dad taught me that from a young age, how to read somebody. You know, he was very, you know, one of the things my dad did teach me about people's handshakes, people's people's eyes and their faces, mouths not matching up. And then people got smiling faces, but their eyes tell a different story. He taught me and my brother that when we were kids. You know, and I took that into my adulthood, <clears throat> which was a survival mode for me. And, and it works. And I'm good at it. You know, and it just so happens today, as a therapist, you know, we read a lot on body language. You know, so I can read a lot of people's body language and where they're at. And now it helps me in a completely different way to understand people's emotions and what's really going on for them. So then just telling me they're fine. I can tell by a lot of stuff that might be going on that maybe they're not quite fine. Do you know what I mean? So what once served as a purpose as a survival mode and now used to try and help other people. And tell us a bit about like how you how you um, man you got into your journey of like becoming well you effectively you've helped change people's lives and to an extent would you say you saved lives in a way with what you well, did? Well, it's all cut cut a long story short. So you know, I came out of prison when I was twenty six. Uh, I came out. I met I met a woman. Uh, we got married. Uh, and we had this whirlwind relationship. It'd been like two and a half years. Big wedding. Da, da, da. You know, I lived with her in Kingston upon Thames. I was working as a security guard. It was a completely different life very quickly. You know, I came straight out when it was a different life that I didn't understand, didn't know anything about. 
Um, you know, and I struggled a bit with it, trying to be this normal living two point in house and a whatever. Um, but we was taking a lot of, I was taking a lot of uh, cocaine. So I was going to school, taking cocaine. And I ended up getting back into selling it a little bit. So I've actually gone back a little bit to where I was before I went into prison. And um, it just all got out of hand. I was doing so much of it, getting very paranoid. I left her, um, I came back to Brixton, carried on selling. I'm selling bigger bits of it, um, but doing more than I was selling. I was literally just selling and sniffing. You know, I looked like I was doing okay. You know, I'd have an expensive shirt on and whatnot, and I could be in the pub and I could buy a few rounds and look flash. But really, I was just... You know, just treading water, just trying to sort of stay stay afloat. Um, but then the mental health kicked in. I was doing so much of it, the drugs got stronger. Um, and I ended up putting myself into a rehab. You know, there was a lot of stuff that happened, build up to that. They said, you know, you need a couple of hours for that. You know, but long story short, I ended up in uh, a detox in, in North London called Sydney Roads Detox. Uh, which is no longer there, sadly, because it was a, a lifesaver. You could actually uh, refer yourself into detox there. Nowadays, you can't do that. So you've got to jump through those dreams. So went into there for three weeks, detox myself, 2005. Christmas 2005, I went in there. While I was in there, I was seen by a care manager from, from the council, and they got me funding to go rehab. I went to rehab. I went to Southampton for three months. And then I've done secondary in Bournemouth uh, for another few months. So I was six months clean. I was getting, you know, I was working out. I was doing a lot of work on myself. Uh, done a lot of, lot of therapy, lots of therapy. Um, I stayed down in Bournemouth for a year. Um, came back here around 2007. Um, 2007 came back to Brixton, and that was from that from there really. That's when I started thinking, okay, I started doing a bit of volunteering. Went back to the the detox center I got cleaner and I'd done some volunteering there. Um realized I was quite good at what what they was asking for. I was quite good at it because I'm a people's person. I had empathy. I knew what these guys were going through. I was taking them to the shop, just having a chat with them. Then I started doing groups. So I was doing like support groups and I was running facilitating that. And basically I went going to the field that way. So by 2009, I was fully fledged in the field, uh, a place called Westminster Drug Project. Um, another long story short, now I'm working in where I live in Brixton, in Lambeth, but I'm leading on relapse prevention in Lambeth. So I run all the relapse prevention groups. Um, I manage I manage a peer mentor service. I've got 13 peer mentors that I train. They're all ex-addicts, clients, that are now volunteers. And I run motivation workshops as well, as well as studying that I'm doing at Regents University at the moment for my integrative therapy. So yeah, busy. <laughs> well, with the how what's it been I mean you mentioned it in the last podcast that you really there was a lady that you changed her life so much that she's now your colleague. Could you tell yeah. us a bit about well, I, no, no, no. I would, I would say that I had changed their life. So I, I don't, I don't ever take credit for changing anybody's lives. But what I will take credit for is that I sort of help support them with their journey and give them tools to make them decisions themselves. So I'd never say that I changed anybody. But this, I mean, there's quite a lot of, you know, the um, the outcomes from the work I do. There's a lot of great outcomes I've got. That I'm very proud of. Um, but I'm proud of them as people uh, and. The one what we spoke about was just uh, uh, probably the, my, one of the main ones. Is that somebody that was once a client of mine, you know, she was drinking, you know, she was, I mean, she was drinking ridiculous amounts. I mean, you know, she could, she wouldn't have, she never had much longer out there. She would, she would have died. You know, we got her to rehab. She came out, she done three months in rehab. She came out, she came back to, to me in Brixton, attended all my groups, um, relapse eventually groups, teaching her tools around that. She started going to other meetings as well, AA meetings. She then became a volunteer. So I trained her up. She became a volunteer. Um, I helped her get funding to go to college to study counselling, level two. Got her the funding. She completed that. So what do you want to do now? She goes, I don't think I want to be a counsellor. I said, I said, well, do level three and see. 
got her the funding. She done the level three. She completed that, and she went on. She finished her diploma. She went to complete her diploma. Um, she then she's now now she's six years. She's six years sober now. She now works in my office next sits next to me, and she's got her own. She's got her own. Um, uh, case over clients that she sees and she's also a qualified therapist so she works three days with me and two days in her own in her own surgery so yeah i mean that's great i mean that's what i do this for you know there's there's lots of them but i would never say that i changed them i, wouldn't, I don't say, i'm not that powerful i'm not that great but I, but I will support them in in making making sort of support them around those changes that they need to go through yeah one of the thing, the two things that really stood out for me, two things that really stood out to me in our last chat were like, you mentioned that even if people have been through a background where they can understand the people that you're helping, some of them yeah. aren't very good because they don't have empathy, they're not good listeners, they don't have good people skills. And you said that the main things, no matter what background you're from, to do well at this job, are good people skills, empathy, and yeah. non-judgmental. Yeah, the reason, the reason I say that as well, because like I said, a lot of people come to my office and they want me to be their key worker. You know, and there's a few of us in the office that have all got backgrounds or all, you know, got some sort of understanding of the street or whatever. But there's also, I have a few colleagues that haven't got that, but are very good at their job. You know, for some people, and I, I remember that, you know, I remember when I was in rehab, if somebody didn't have a, a drug addiction or never done a few, I didn't really want to listen to them. And I only listened to people that, that was like me, that sort of looked like me, or they were like me in, in some respects. Um, but I never really got that much, you know, it, it, it was great because it was inspiring. So I was inspired by them. But it was actually like a, a middle-aged, old white lady, um, posh, uh, very posh, middle-class counsellor that I got my most learning from because when I was bringing stuff to her, she was coming from a completely different angle. She, she was loving, she was caring, you know, I knew that I believed and trusted that she wanted the best for me. And she saw things from a completely different place than where somebody like myself or people have grown. Now we are looking, we, do, do, do you get what I'm saying? So what I was saying was that just because somebody doesn't have uh, a past in drugs and alcohol or gang crime or doesn't mean to say they don't understand, you know? But if they've just read it from a book, and they've got no empathy, no understanding, then yeah, it's not gonna work. So people skills and empathy, if somebody's got empathy and they, know, and they know how to channel that, you know, that there is enough to help somebody that wants help. And if somebody's coming for help and I feel that you've got, I trust you and I feel that you've got empathy because you understand whether you've been it or not, I'm gonna trust you. Do do you get, have you seen some mad instances where someone's tried to do it and it's had a complete adverse reaction to a client? Like yeah, 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 yeah. I, I mean, I've worked, and this is the other thing. So I've worked with people that are just a bit like myself that have got, been in prison, been in addiction, been in a lot of violent situations and they're working in the field now, which looks great and inspiring, but they're shit. They're shit at their job, you know, because what they do, they, they would sit in a group and they would talk all about themselves. You know, it becomes their show, you know. They forget that it's about the client and not about them, and they just want to talk about their own experience, and it just becomes... Now, the one thing I... I mean, I, I talk on these, on these podcasts, I talk about my life, but I don't do this in my in my, um, in my my groups. You know, in fact, I don't even do a check-in. You know, it's not about me. It's about the guys that are here turned up today. And you do get some people, because they do know it all, or think they know, think they know it all, they would just talk the whole lot and people just listen and it just becomes like a bloody preacher show and then they walk out of there and forget it all in five minutes because that hasn't come from their own vocal cords. And is it that to do with ownership as well? Like you've... Yeah, I mean, I don't think so. I think ego. I think some people... You get two types of people, that, and I say this a lot, two types of people that come through recovery, that have been in addiction, been through hardship, you either get the uh, the grateful, or you get the entitled. So you get certain people that think they're entitled because they've been through it. You know what I mean, well, I should have this and I should get this. And then you get the ones that come through that are very humble and grateful for, for the chance to have another kind of life. These are the ones that go go the furthest on this. You know, you see the ones that have been there and, you know, and they give it all that and they talk. 
you know, you see him on fucking James English chatting shit. You know what I mean? Oh. Like, you know, you know, just sort of like, you know, just in terms of, you know, just sort of full of ego. There's no humility there. You see the ones on there, just uh, I not sure mention James English, but you know, you see some really humble ones, but you see a lot of them guys that think, because they've done it. Uh, time, uh, you know you what I mean? I, I did speak to, yeah, it does, does feel with some of them, with James English, that they're being blustery. Like they're trying to inflate themselves. I know a few themselves. people have been on there. I know a few people have been on that done uh, interviews with you know, And they've been genuine, genuine guys. But some of them, the point, point being is this, you get some people that are just so full of ego. And the thing is, for me, if you're genuine, and I genuinely want to help people, that's what I'm about. You know, I genuinely want to help people. I genuinely want to better myself. I genuinely want to be the best version of me so I can help other people as well. You know, there's no ego here. Even though I can come across it sometimes when I'm talking about something, but there's definitely no ego. You know, humility is, is a key factor for me. You know, and I'm not judging anybody and I just want to help as many people. But if I've been in a similar situation to get from that to where I am now. That's, that is my goal, as many people as I can. Now, one of the things that we said in the last podcast was, and this is something that I watched in, I didn't want to say what it was because, well, when you do a lot of things, not everyone is your friend in the course or whatever. So I didn't want to reveal, maybe I'm sounding dodgy saying this, but I don't want to reveal all my thoughts and ideas to people that I'm not necessarily friends with. Um, but the thing is, um, have you seen the episode with uh, Guy Ritchie? And like um, with uh, Joe Rogan about extreme ownership? Because it mentions what you said no. about the best, uh, the, about a lot of the people that get through drugs and change their life around. You say that you yeah. start from where they're at and they take ownership of the things rather than blaming what's happened. And this is exactly what Guy Ritchie said. Yeah, said they, they um, take responsibility. Like, it's a fact. But, if I, like, so, so you, you get people, so what happens is when we're in addiction or when people are in addiction, one, the one thing that keeps you in addiction is blaming everything else. Blaming your parents, blaming the community, blaming the police, blame. And while you're blaming, 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 you're not taking ownership or responsibility for your own self. The cornerstone to, to recovery is responsibility. You know, self esteem, self respect, and uh, responsibility, taking personal responsibility. And the ones that come in, the ones that I see walk through that door and they've got full of gratitude, you know, almost like they've just. Almost like the fucking the drowning man. You know, when, the, when you pull the drowning man out of the water and they take that breath. I see guys coming like that. They walk into our building and you see them take that breath like they've just, you know, like they were just about to go. And they're full of gratitude. And all they want to do is we get, you know, they, you know, they, they get humble. Because you have to humble yourself to ask for help. You know, the people out there that are using and don't want to humble themselves and ask for help and they're blaming everyone else for their addiction and for their problems. But yet, they're 56 years of age and they're still walking around doing this, blaming everyone else. It's never gonna, they're never going to get it. You know? mm. Until you humble yourself, you know, get a bit of gratitude and humility, and then things will change. It will change. It's bloody hard. Is it a bit like the Rocky speech that he gave to his son? Have you seen the film? <laughs> I love the speech. Yeah, I love Rocky. I love that Rocky speech, speech was good. Life's about what's it called? It's about how you get. It's about how hard you can get it and keep moving forward and not not blaming it while you're here or this and that yeah no, that's right, yeah I, no i love that speech i love that speech about what's it called guy ritchie and there's also there's a bit from Tyrion lannister in game of thrones mm -hmm. like when you're talking about insecurity like mm -hmm. he says to john snow never mm -hmm. never forget what you are bastard because then it can't be used against you yeah. uh, these are things that are hard to put in that i want to try and put in with myself but I love these things. I feel that that, yeah. that is something that you, your weaknesses, you hold them as armour, you accept them as what they are, you take ownership, and then you try and change things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. That's it, you've sussed it. If you can't do my job. Oh, I'm <laughs> sounding like, like a right arrogant prick here, aren't I? I'm, that's it, I'm no, finished. No, 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 not at all, not at all, you're all right. But... <laughs> That's what I feel. Like I, I get all sorts of insults all the time, like in the course and like other things. People get all sorts of funny ideas. But if I if I didn't take this, like yes, this is me. This is my weaknesses. I ain't perfect. I've got a lot to work on. But if you don't like it, fair enough. Oh, fucking hell! Sorry, man. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. 
I feel like I'm doing a bit of therapy here. I feel, it feels good. Yeah, I need to pay you now. <laughs> <laughs> but I could. I've just I've seen the change happening in you. You've gone from this sort of timid guy, and like, fuck this, I'm gonna fucking take responsibility for myself. <laughs> I don't know. Some sometimes the podcast, I feel it's a bit of both. I do the therapy for the comedian, com another person, and then sometimes yeah. I get a bit as well. Yeah, there you go. Everyone's a winner. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, but you know, I hundred percent like follow what you what you said there about taking responsibility and. Like going from where you are, like you can't change yeah. the past. You are where you are. What, what's can't the point of moping about it? Just fucking yeah. get on and do things. Yeah, exactly. There we go. Inside out. Now, <laughs> for anyone that's listening to the podcast right now, what advice would you give to them in like, if they're struggling, if they really, you know, if they're losing hope that they can change their life around, what's one thing you would say to them? One thing I'm saying there is help out there. You know, people have to believe that as well. I know because a lot of people say there is help. There is help. You know, you've got to reach out. One of the toughest things you're going to do, and I, I always use this analogy. You know, um, just before, just before the, sorry, wrong, just before the caterpillar, um, just before the caterpillar turned into a butterfly, he thought life was over. He thought his life was over, and then he became a cat uh, butterfly. The same thing with with this, you know, if you're suffering with, with uh, especially with addiction, mental health, you feel like you're at that end where nothing's gonna, you know, where life is over. There's another, you just gotta push that one more, one more, push through, make that call, because there's plenty of numbers out there as well. There's plenty of small numbers. I mean, you, you can start with the Samaritans, if, you, if that's where you wanna start with. If you start with Samaritans, they've got all the details, every service in your area. But it's just about just not giving up and just sort of, reaching out for help. You need to reach out. There's so many people there that don't want to reach out, don't want to ask for help, you know, and that's that's what's killing a lot of people out there. You know, I've got people that come into my centre that lived in Brixton all their lives, never knew what that centre was. Walked past it for 30 years. Never even thought about, you know, and then, you know, fucking dying out here of drug addiction and then come walking in and finding that we were there. So looking for help, seeking help, you know. You can't do this on your own. Anybody who tries to work with their mental health and their addiction on their own, you're in trouble. You need help. Reach out. Hmm. And where do they find out about you, Junior? Instagram, OnlyFans, where do they go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, you can find me on Instagram. You know, if anybody wants to sort of just send me a message or whatever, if they, especially, I mean, if, they, if you're living in the Lambeth area, I've, you know, I've got, that's where I'm based, you know, and I can put you in the right direction or you can come and see me have a chat if you're struggling with addiction. Come and have a chat with me in my office, not a problem. All right. So you know where to go. I hope you guys have enjoyed the episode. I'll see you guys soon. Uh, Junior, hope you've had fun. Take yeah, care. thank you. Say goodbye to Stanley. Hi, hello, Stanley. Isn't that the Liverpool knife thing? Don't they say that? it's... You're late, mate. Do you know Stanley? <laughs> that's what she was named after oh okay fair enough oh, so joking, guys <laughs> don't mess okay be careful guys oh. <laughs>